The Boys, Volume 8, Highland Laddie. This is covering issues 1 through 6 of the Highland and Laddie miniseries, written by Garth Ennis, art by John McRae with Keith Burns. Now, before I dive into Volume 8, let's talk about the poll I asked you all to vote on in my last video. And the results of that poll as of August 21st, Wednesday night, are Invincible winning with 35% of the vote, followed by Why the Last Man, then Preacher, then Sandman, then Jupiter's Legacy. And we also have a pretty big sample size of 2,101 votes. So thank you all for voting. Super helpful. I'm glad you are all interested in a lot of the same stuff I'm interested in talking about. So I will, in fact, do Invincible next after the boys. But I am going to try and do all of these series. That is the uh, end goal. So I'm going to maybe do the first compendium of Invincible and then circle over to uh, Why the Last Man, try to get that done before the TV show happens, squeeze in Jupiter's legacy in there. It's not very long. Finish off Invincible, head over to Preacher, and then do Sandman as well as uh, do many other series. Some notable series people mentioned in the comments that I would love to cover are uh, Fables, Saga, 100 bullets. There's so many. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to try and tackle all of this stuff. Okay, let's talk about volume eight of the boys Highland Laddie. So this is a mini series. We have John McRae back on the art and it's not the best art once again. And I have to say, this is probably unfortunately the weakest volume of the boys. It is not the same kind of debaucherous, bombastic fun that we normally get with the boys. This is a more quiet, reserved, introspective volume. It is a Huey going back to Scotland and sort of self-analyzing himself. As well, we get an origin for Annie, so that is interesting. And we see Huey and Annie sort of work out the problems in their relationship. And there's a lot of talking in this volume. There's still a little bit of some craziness and some fun mixed in, but definitely a lot of talking in this volume. And some people may not dig it so much, but I still think there is some important stuff that the volume covers. So uh, let's dive into the story in this volume. Issue one, the harbor at the world's end. So after becoming jaded by his dangerous work in the boys, and after finding out his girlfriend Annie is actually a member of the Seven, and seeing her give a triple blowjob on a security footage camera, Huey needs a break to collect his thoughts and decide what he wants to do next. So he has returned to his childhood home in Scotland, to his hometown of Ochtraladdle a relatively peaceful seaside town in northern Scotland. Now Huey slowly walks through the town. He sees some old familiar sights. He hears his mom singing a tune in the backyard and he walks up to her and he hugs her hello and Huey's dad rushes over as well. And Huey's parents are Daphne and Eck Campbell. Now inside the house they catch up a bit Huey doesn't really want to go into details about his time in America. His parents tell Huey he is welcome to stay with them as long as he wants. Huey then decides to go see some of his old friends that live in the town, and he goes to see his one friend, Horace Bronson, and he has the nickname Det, D-E-T, in reference to detergent because he never uses any and he smells terrible. The doctors say he's just naturally a smelly guy. Now maybe this is the reason he wears this ridiculous looking gas mask. Now apparently Huey and Det haven't seen each other for nearly seven or eight years. Now they head over to the local pub where Huey's other childhood friend is there, a guy named Big Bobby, who apparently is a cross-dresser. And we see him in a wig with eye makeup, pearls, and a dress on. So they all grab some beer and are catching up Huey tells them what he's been up to, how he moved to Glasgow, which is Scotland's most populous city. And then from there, he eventually moved to America for a job, but it didn't really work out. Huey is a little vague with his friends about his job and all the details involving that. So he doesn't get into his work with the boys and Butcher and all that. So eventually, Big Bobby explains his cross-dressing, saying he just feels more comfortable dressed as a woman. Although he's still into women sexually, so he's what you would call maybe a lesbian now. So Huey eventually goes to get another round of beer and we meet this bartender named Mr. Holmes 
aka Beezer, who apparently this Beezer knows Huey, and this Beezer doesn't like Huey because back when Huey and his friends were young, Beezer was running some sort of illegal tobacco smuggling business out of this place called Smuggler's Cove, and Huey told the police and this Beezer got in trouble and went to jail for it. So uh, Beezer gives Huey his beers, but he curses Huey out and is not happy to see Huey here. So we learn here that Huey's parents, which we met earlier, are actually Huey's adopted parents, and Huey doesn't know who his real parents are. Now Bobby and Det, they reminisce of a made up story they used to tell Huey as a kid to sort of mess with him. They used to joke that Huey's real dad was actually an airline pilot, and one day his dad was taking a piss out of the plane door and he fell out, and he landed in a snowdrift and somehow miraculously survived. But the piss that he took out of the plane, it was, it, as it was falling, it hardened like an icicle in the cold weather and it froze into a spear type shape and it landed right through Huey's dad's head, killing him. So Det and Bobby sort of laugh about this story. Uh, it's obviously a made up story. They don't really know what happened with Huey's dad. And they ask Huey, did you ever go looking for your real parents? And Huey says, as far as he's concerned, Daphne and Eck are his real parents. Now we jump back in time for a bit and we see Huey in America at the boys HQ before he left for Scotland and he's saying goodbye to everybody. Apparently Huey and Mother's Milk went to dinner the night before to talk and say goodbye then. So Mother's Milk isn't here at the moment. And we also learn that Huey gave up his apartment. He gave his hamster Jamie to be looked after by the female while he's gone. And then Butcher says, you take as long as you need, Huey. Sort yourself out. Come back when you're ready. Now, although Huey doesn't know if he's ever going to come back to the boys, now before Huey heads out, Huey asks Butcher, did you know? And then Butcher replies, no what? And then we leave that moment and come back to the current day in Scotland. So Huey, after drinking with his friends, Det and Bobby, uh, they leave the bar and Det and Bobby are absolutely trash. They are really drunk. But Huey, who has Compound V in his system, is relatively unaffected by the alcohol. So Huey says bye to his friends for the night, and Huey decides to go for a walk. And as he's going for a walk, he meets this man named Alistair Vigors, who is a guy who's up from Surrey, and he's doing some paintings of the local area up here. And Huey admires his painting of this sunset. Now, the two of them talk for a bit, and Huey kind of confides with this random stranger. Huey explains how he's back in town and he, he was catching up with his old mates and they're remembering all the good stuff, but then his friends have to go and remind him about all the times they were wankers to him as well. And Huey says, I suppose I'm just wondering which version of them is more true. The one where they're nice to me or the one where they're wankers to me. Now the last page of this issue we jump to some other weird figures in the car in the shadows. We don't really know who's inside, but they seem to be some sort of drug dealers. And they are talking about importing some cocaine laced with compound V. And apparently they know Huey a little bit and they don't like that he's back in town because when he was a kid, he was always sticking his nose and stuff and solving mysteries and whatnot. And they hope he's not gonna be a problem. Issue two, Great Glass Elevator. Huey is hanging out with that Alistar Vigors once again. Alistar is sketching some birds in the local area, and Alistar says something seemingly unimportant here, but it comes into play later. So Alistar is talking about this bird. It's not a seagull, it's called a falmar. And when threatened, this bird can eject a stream of curdled fish oil and other semi-digested horrors at a range of about 10 feet. The stench lasts for weeks, and if you find yourself near this bird's nest, you best head in the other direction. Huey is complaining about an incident in his childhood where he was allowed up into the cockpit of an airplane and the pilot had a nervous breakdown, and it kind of scarred Huey after that. Huey also complains that when he was in Glasgow, people sort of pissed him off and Huey would always remember his hometown friends and miss them. Same as when he was with the boys in New York and the boys would make fun of him and annoy him, Huey would always remember his hometown friends and sort of idolize those memories. But now that Huey is finally home again and he is with those friends, they are kind of annoying him. So Huey now is just sort of thinking about going back to New York. 
Anyway, Huey seems to be having a case of like the grass is greener on the other side. So Huey decides to head off, but he makes plan to hang out with Alistar once again tomorrow. So later on in the day, Huey is hanging out with Det and Bobby, and they are going down to this beach called Smuggler's Cove. Huey spots a, an inflatable sex doll out in the middle of this lake, and Huey is wondering what the deal with this sex doll is. It, lo it looks like it's not moving with the waves, like it's tethered to the bottom, and Huey is kind of curious about it. His friends th don't seem that interested, though. They are too busy smoking some weed that they all brought. But this all triggers a memory for them, and they remember when they were little kids, and Beezer, who was that guy he met at the bar, Beezer got arrested for smuggling tobacco out of Smuggler's Cove. See, when Huey and his friends were little kids, they kept seeing Beezer go to the beach with nothing, and then he would come back with a car full of bags. So eventually, one day, they followed him out to Smuggler's Cove, and they called the police on him, and the police came and arrested Beezer, and they beat him up with their billy clubs. So that's why Beezer hates these guys. So after this story, uh, Big Bobby comments, though, that they never did find out where that tobacco was coming in from, so we, they never really found out who Beezer's contact was. And they reminisce some more. Now we jump back in time a bit, and uh, it's the day before Huey left America for Scotland, and Huey is having dinner with Mother's Milk. And they are discussing things, they're discussing Butcher and how Butcher seems to be using his CIA money to fight his own private war against the Seven. And they discuss all the history between all of these different people. But no real new information is really discussed here though. Now back in the present day, it is nighttime at Smuggler's Cove. And we see the mysterious drug dealers that we sort of were introduced to a little bit at the end of last issue. And they, these drug dealers are meeting their Russian suppliers, and they are getting their delivery of coke mixed with Compound V. And that sex toy that we saw in the water was just a marker of where to bring the boat. So the guy the Russians are dealing with, who seems to be the big drug runner in Scotland, is a guy named Joe Tupper. He is from Glasgow, not this small town. He is just here to set up this deal and then go back to his home base in Glasgow. Joe Tupper gets his partner to sample the drug and it seems like good stuff. So now it's time to unload all the drugs off the boat and into the car of two locals. These two punk kids known as the Bum Fluff Brothers, who are in charge of driving the product all around Scotland for Joe. But all of a sudden, these Bum Fluff Brothers want a better deal and more of a cut, so they threaten to maybe give an anonymous call to the police if they don't get more money from Joe, and Joe Tupper can't believe that these bumfluff brothers are negotiating right now in the middle of transporting the drugs off the boat. So Joe calls his niece Sarah over, and Sarah is massive and intimidating, and she has some gardening shears and almost cuts one of the bumfluff brothers' faces off. But the Bumfluff brothers scream for mercy and they accept whatever the initial deal was, even accepting a pay cut. So they unload some of the drugs, but the Russians say they'll deliver the rest tomorrow night as the sun will be up soon and there's not enough time. So Tupper asks the two frightened punk guys, well, what do people do around here for fun? Issue 3, Beware the Jabberwock, my son. So it's the next day and Huey is talking with that Alistar once again. And Huey is telling a story of when he was a little kid, he had an Auntie Mary and she maybe had dementia or Alzheimer's or something and she was known to wander. And she was staying with Huey's family for a while. And one night she goes into the bathroom and she passed a 17 foot tapeworm. And it looks disgusting. And Huey came face to face with it. Auntie, this was so super random. Like, this is so weird. Why is this happening in this book right now? Anyway, <laughs> Huey explains eventually the doctor took his aunt away. Now, Huey analyzing himself with this Alistair Vigor says that he thinks he's too squeamish to be a tough guy. And every time something mental happens to him, he goes back to that tapeworm moment and he remembers going all cold and tingly and just shutting down. And Alistar asks Huey, do you see a lot of violence in your life? And Huey kind of evades the question. And then he muses that not being a tough guy means you can't make a difference in life. And Alistar asks, is that what you want to make a difference in the world? 
and Huey says he just wants to stop things from getting worse. And Alistair says, I don't really have an answer to give you here to help you, Huey. And Huey just says, it's okay. It's nice to be able to talk about this stuff. I can't talk about this, this kind of things with my parents or my friends. So really what kind of Huey is debating here is he's debating whether he should be more like Butcher and be really tough and be like really violent and go against these soups to sort of bring real change to the world and stop these soups. Or maybe he should stop trying to fight against his more soft, good-hearted nature. So this is sort of a theme we're going to see explored in this volume. Huey is now with his parents and they are eating scones and they are apparently delicious. Huey has a mark on his face, so his mom comes and wants to uh, wipe his face for him and clean his face. And this kind of sets Huey off. He storms off and he's kind of angry. And then he's like talking to himself and he says to himself, not everything you do has to be for me. Do you see how guilty you're making me feel? Make me happy one minute, mental the next. Why can't I tell you to stop? Why can't I say this shit to you? Treating me like a kid all my life. Is it any wonder I turned out to be a wimp? So Huey is kind of angry with his parents for kind of uh, loving him too much and making him soft and not tough. So once again, coming back to that butcher theme I mentioned earlier. Huey runs into his friends and he's a little cranky with them again when they start joking around with him a bit. And then Huey, Det, and Bobby, they run into this Reverend Jimmy Dandy and he's trying to get them to come to church on Sunday and he's kind of saying all these weird things and then he exchanges pleasantries with Huey. So Huey and his friends then head to a bar in town and we see that drug dealer Joe Tupper and he's with his niece Sarah and Joe is on the phone talking business. Now the bartender, this Beezer, he brings a drink over to Joe, but Joe says he wanted the drink neat, meaning no ice. So he berates the bartender and the bartender trying to uh, please this Joe Topper says he'll fix it right away. So the bartender uses his hand to fish out and remove the ice cubes from the glass, which is obviously not a good way to remedy the situation. You don't want this bartender's dirty hands in your drink taking out the ice cubes. So now Joe Topper is getting even angrier and he's like, well, you could have just spit in it or why don't you take a shit in the glass? And uh, Huey and his friends are watching this all go down. But they're having a good time. They're hanging out and they're drinking. And Huey is not whining for once as he's been doing so far this issue. Afterwards, Huey heads home back to his parents' house and he's in high spirits. But when he heads inside his house, Annie is there waiting for him and Huey is not happy to see her. Issue four, a young man's fancy. So Annie has came all the way to Scotland to talk with Huey. So they're gonna have a conversation. Annie's trying to discuss things, but Huey is kind of just shutting her down. And Annie wants to tell Huey the truth. She says, I think I owe you that much, don't I? And Huey replies, I know the truth. And Annie replies to that, you know some of it. Come on, let me tell you the rest. That can be the reason I came here. Huey is still pouting, but Annie says, well, you just keep glaring into the horizon and I'll just start talking. So Annie explains her origin. She says, I was born in Des Moines, Iowa with superpowers. I don't know which of my parents was exposed to compound V or how it might've happened. There are a million ways, but either way, I can fly. I can generate intense bursts of light. I've got amazing hearing, but it requires a lot of concentration. And when Annie was born, she actually blinded her parents in the hospital room when she came out of the womb. And Vaught American were on the case right away and they swooped in with their lawyers. And they had Annie's parents sign her over to Vaught American. The parents were promised visitation rights, some money, and now that they were blind for life, it was gonna be tough for them. So maybe the money would help with their condition. Also, the doctor and the midwife that delivered the baby were blind themselves, so they were considering a lawsuit against Annie's parents. But Vought American would make that all go away. They would deal with that. So, and Vought even threw in some seeing eye dogs for her parents. So, so the point is, Vought American now owns Annie. And Annie found this out all later in life because she saw her real parents once a year. And then eventually when she was 16, they told her as much as they thought they could that the uh, non-disclosure agreement would allow them to tell her. So when Annie was little though, 
She was locked away till she was about five years old and tranquilized until she could be reasoned with and make sure her powers wouldn't be used to sort of attack other people accidentally. Then Von American gave her to some foster parents who had to finish teaching her that it was wrong to use her powers on people and that she had to control it carefully, but that she was an extremely lucky little girl because if she was good and did what she was told, she could one day be a superhero. Really, it was the job of the foster families to take the kids away and come back when they figured that the kids were ready to be superheroes. Then, when the kids were ready, Vought would hold one of their pageants to test for potential new superheroes. There was a lot riding on these pageants, lots of pressure. You can imagine the benefits of having a corporate sponsored super kid. And the parents, they told their kids every day how important this was, how you couldn't fail, how you had to try and try because mommy and daddy were counting on you so much and you didn't want to disappoint them. So Annie went up on stage in front of Vaught American's people who decided whether her powers are going to make the cut or not. And luckily, Starlight's powers are pretty good. She can fly, she can shine really bright. So she passes and she's going to be put on one of the hero teams. But this other little girl that was on after Annie, her powers aren't kicking off so well. And the Vaught people are not impressed with her. And her parents, her adopted parents, are yelling at her. So this is what it was all for? This is it? Come on, get up. Stop that and get up. And the little girl is crying because her parents are yelling at her. And she's freaking out because her powers aren't working how they're supposed to. And Vought American isn't impressed with her. And eventually Vought security people have to come in and swoop in and take her away. Now stepping away from Huey and Annie for a bit, Back at the bar, Joe Topper and his niece Sarah and the Bum Fluff brothers are discussing the incoming shipment from the Russians. Now Beezer from the bar is smiling. We learn that Topper was Beezer's supplier of the tobacco ages ago. But when this Beezer eventually got caught because of Huey, Topper lost five grand worth of stuff. So he refuses to do business with Beezer again. And Beezer is desperate to get back into Tupper's good graces though, because he wants more illegal work. He wants to make more money. Now the Bum Fluff brothers, they're talking to Joe Tupper and they say that, you know, we Googled what these drugs do to people, this Coke laced with compound V. And there's all these horror stories of people getting on the drug and accidentally killing themselves or burning their house down or whatever happened in this image here where this dude's head got super enlarged. And they asked Topper, you ever worry what this stuff does to people? And then Topper says, no more than I worry when I was moving coke or smack. And the Bumfluff brothers say, well, if you have this compound B stuff, they give you 25 years just for possession of this stuff. And I'm starting to see why. And Topper says, look, most folk just get high off this stuff. Sure, there's a handful of million to one cases, but if some folks can't handle their high, Tough shit. I don't want to be hearing any of this anymore, okay? As Joe Tupper is heading to the men's room, Alistar Vigors is there and bumps into him. Perhaps Alistar overheard this whole conversation? Now jumping back over to Annie. Annie's continuing her story of her origin. So she passed Von American's test in the pageant and she was put on her very first superhero team, the Young Americans. And just to break down that team once again, so we have Starlight, we have Drummer Boy, who I guess drums or something. There's Holy Mary and her power is her beauty, which allowed her to manipulate men's will. There is the Standard, he has the power of flight, and he is eventually elected to be the original team leader of the Young Americans. There is General Issue, his powers are slightly mediocre, he has the strength of four men, and he is able to run 45 miles per hour without running out of breath. He was also trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat and it is an expert shot with any weapon. So when Annie joins the Young Americans, she meets her group coordinator, her PR lady, the events planner, the makeup artist, her liaison with Von American, and her team counselor. And then the Young Americans are told, you guys cover everything between Arkansas and the Canadian border and west as far as Wyoming, but don't go near Chicago. We're thinking of moving payback there if the Mavericks don't pan out. So Von American really has a whole bureaucracy sort of set up for these heroes. So the new team of young Americans vote for their new leader and the standard is selected. And now they have to figure out what to do. 
because Von American didn't really give them that much guidance. So they decided, well, let's buy a police scanner and we'll figure it out and we'll go out and stop stuff on the police scanner. But mostly they would just hear about traffic accidents or bar fights on the police scanner. Now, Huey comments to Annie through this story and he says, that's the thing that bothered me about soups. You got all these powers, but you got no idea what you're doing. So why do you dress up and start doing it? I mean, if you really want to help folk, why don't you just go to the hospital or fly casualties in after an accident or offer to kick down the door for firemen? I mean, at least they could train you properly. And Annie responds, it never came up for us. With hindsight, I guess Vought don't want superpowers anywhere near federal or local services, not unless it's on their terms. I'd almost say that what Vought, what Vought is pushing is the idea of soups as an alternative to official help. But the young Americans, they did do some good though. There was a flooding and they saved a lot of people in rural areas. Vought specifically kept them away from the urban areas in case they screwed up. And the media, while they were saving these flood victims, happened to swoop in and record the action and film it. And that meant media attention, which eventually led to celebrity, which led to moving product, comic books, magazines, and TV shows, cameos, brands, logos, clothing lines, which meant more disaster pseudo relief and photo ops. Annie then asks Huey, how did you not recognize me? Because, you know, I was a little bit, I was famous after all. And Huey says, I don't know. I mean, you know how there's some folk that just never got into sports? I just never got into a superhero, so I, I just didn't know. Annie continues her story, and she says, The publicity, the cheesy glamour, the limits of what we were allowed to do with our powers, her fling with Drummer Boy, it was all kind of stupid. She lived with it all, though, and she refused to look too hard or read too deep into it. She hid. She was still convinced that there was a place being a superhero could really mean something real, where all these childhood promises would be fulfilled. And that place was the Seven. And when she got called up to test to be Lamplighter's replacement in the Seven, and she passed the test, it was like getting into heaven for her. It was all she ever wanted in life. Every last scrap of ambition she ever had was focused on this. And when the moment came and the truth of it slammed into her like an iron wall and she saw what she would really have to do to make the team, Annie says, well, I guess I was ready to live with one last thing. She's referring to what she had to do with the Homelander, Black Noir, and A-Train. Annie and Huey start walking back and Huey offers for her to stay at his parents' place if she wants. And then Annie asks Huey, so are you going to tell me how you really saw that footage of me? And Huey replies, I already told you. And then Annie calls bullshit on his answer though. And she argues, I know what you told me. Someone emailed you five minutes from a surveillance camera from the base of the world's premier super team. One they themselves don't even know is there. And it happens to be the segment showing me, your girlfriend, except no one knows that but the two of us. And it's me blowing A-Train, Black Noir, and Homelander so that they'll let me join the seven. Me getting down on my knees and putting them in my mouth and sucking things. And Annie continues and Huey doesn't want to hear about this sexual stuff. And Annie yells back at him because that's what a girl like me would do, isn't it? That's what a bitch and a whore. And she repeats all the mean phrases that Huey threw at her last volume when he was breaking up with her. And then Huey just yells back, no, stop, please. And Annie continues, isn't it? Isn't that what I do? Say it. You were pretty goddamn brave last time. Say it. And Huey just says, please, Annie, stop, please, please, please. And after they calm down, Huey admits he was too harsh on her. And he says, I'm sorry, whatever else happened, I had no right to say the shit I said to you. It was absolutely disgusting and it was awful of me. I've never said anything like that to a girl in my life. I didn't even know I was the sort of fella that could say those kind of things. And Annie replies, well, that's the funny thing, Huey. I'm not all that sure you are. I remember you. You could hardly get the words out. It was like you were reading from a bad script, like you really didn't believe any of it. And Huey replies, but I did say it. And then Annie says, oh yes, you said it. You said it all right, but can you make it stick? Issue five, Wisdom of the Ages. It is the next morning, Annie has slept over at Huey's parents' house in the guest bedroom. 
And he says Huey's parents are really sweet people. Huey says he never cared who his real parents were because his adoptive ones loved him so much. Even if they do drive me around the bend half the bloody time. And he thanks Huey for apologizing to her. And then Huey goes downstairs and talks with his dad. And Huey's dad tells Huey that Annie's a nice girl. He also tells Huey that a girl like that won't wait around forever. And Huey interprets this as his dad telling him that Annie is out of his league, which let's face it, it is totally true. Annie and Huey then go for a walk around the village and talk some more. Huey says to Annie, I meant my apology to you and what you did happened before I even met you. So in a way, it's none of my business. It's not as if I think you're proud of it, far from it. But the fact is, I saw it, and that means there's just no future for us, because I'll never be able to get it out of my head. And then Annie argues, if it was a guy with three girls because he wanted to get on a super team, or for any other reason, you wouldn't have a problem with it at all. You'd probably even be jealous. And Huey says, if it was anyone doing anything to get on a superhero team, I'd tell them to F off. And then Annie responds, well, I did mean what I said about quitting the seven. And she continues, you know, what makes this difficult is I'm being honest with you as I can, and you're still keeping stuff from me. And then Huey replies, what do you want from me? I mean, look, the way you look, you could have anyone. What the hell are you even doing with me? And then Annie says, I fell in love with you, you dick. And I know you love me too, or part of you does. And I hate that all this great stuff between us is going to be wasted because of some stupid sex stuff. And then Huey says, I get what you're saying. I love what we had as well. And I get your point about the double standard. If it was a guy with three girls and I guess it's sexist or whatever, but I just don't think I'll ever be able to get past it. And then Annie says, so where does that leave us? And Huey doesn't know. Huey and Annie walk on and they run into that reverend dandy who is rambling incoherently and bothering that Alistar Vigors. And Huey shoos the crazy reverend away. And Alistar introduces himself to Annie, and the three of them get chatting. Huey, picking up from a previous conversation, says that he doesn't want to be a hard bastard. Can you imagine the price you'd pay to be that violent all the time? Mentally like. And then Huey goes on to vaguely describe Butcher's confrontation with an alchemical. And he's basically saying that Butcher made up his mind up in one second that that guy was getting killed. And what followed was a foregone conclusion. Like, killing him was an act of will. And Alistar says, And your friend, do you think he's paid this mental price you mentioned? And Huey says, I think he has, but I don't think he minded paying it all that much. Just then, Alistar remembers that. He says that he bumped into... Huey's friend Bobby earlier, and Bobby gave him a message to give to Huey to be at Smuggler's Cove at 10 p.m. And Huey searches for his cell phone to try and message Bobby, but he can't find his phone. So Huey just decides to show up at 10 p.m. at Smuggler's Cove and find Bobby there, and Bobby is there. And Huey's talking to Bobby, and Bobby says, I never talked to that Alistar Vigors guy. I came here because you texted me and told me to meet you here at 10 p.m. And Huey's confused by this, and he says, oh, someone must have got a hold of my phone or something. So it, it appears that that Alistar was setting this up, and he wanted both Huey and Bobby to be here at this moment. Just then, the shipment of drugs are coming in, and Huey and Bobby hear people in the distance, so they sneak up to take a look. They see their friend, Det, talking with the drug dealers, and he is somehow involved with this Joe Tupper and that whole crew. Just then, as Huey and Bobby are watching this, Sarah, that butch lady, appears behind Huey and Bobby and attacks them. Bobby pushes Huey out of the way and fights Sarah, and Bobby yells, girl fight, and then they go at it. Huey rolls down the hill, and all of a sudden, he is face to face with his friend, Det. And Huey asks Det, what are you doing here? And Huey recognizes the drugs in the compound V. The Russians that are in their boat, they get nervous thinking Huey is maybe a police officer and they take off. And Joe Tupper is trying to yell at the Russians and telling them, it's not the police, it's just some wanker. And the Russians by this point have already gone off. Huey yells at Det, Det, 
That is coke cut with compound B. Do you know what that shit does to folk? Do you know what you're getting involved in here? Tupper says, what a night this is turning out to be. And he goes and tries to shoot Huey. Issue six, made from girders. So Joe Tupper shot at Huey, but Det jumped in front of the way and took the bullet. Sarah, who knocked out Bobby, is at the top of the hill, and she yells to her Uncle Joe that the police are coming in the distance. All of a sudden, Alistar is there, and he's behind Sarah, and he hits her over the head with a rock, knocking her out. Joe Tupper, he runs off, and then Huey asks his friend, Det, what are you doing? And Det replies, he needed money for an operation in China to get rid of his smell. Det then dies. And Huey is crying. The Bumfluff brothers are give up when the police arrive. They're not going to fight the police off. But Huey, he runs after that Joe Tupper who shot his friend. Huey is furious. He has tears in his eyes. Joe is on top of this hill, but then all of a sudden, randomly, a bird spits in his mouth. Joe trips and falls down the hill. And the police arrive and they are there to arrest all the drug dealers. And Huey flashes his CIA badge, and the Scotland police let him leave. So the first time we're seeing Huey really using those credentials to get out of a situation here. Later on, Huey and Annie are at the hospital visiting Bobby, who got injured during the fighting. Apparently during the fight, Sarah with those gardening shears snipped off Bobby's penis. And they were going to sew it back on, but Bobby says... He was thinking about getting this done for ages and getting the operation to remove his wang. So he might as well just go through with the surgery to get sorted with his lady parts. And uh, when he does get those lady parts, he's looking forward to scissoring with other girls and he's excited to try that out. Uh, Bobby and Huey then sort of remember their friend Det for a bit, sort of commemorate him and are sad he is gone. And the two of them say goodbye. Later on in the day, Huey and Annie go down to the pub Beezer just curses at Huey once again, saying, Do you know what I had to do to survive in bloody prison? But Huey and Annie, they grab their beer and they go on to the back patio to talk. And Huey says to Annie, You said this place is like a sanctuary for me. And it is sort of, but it's also this place that's full of stuff that annoys the shit out of me. And I'm thinking, if I'm not happy here, where will I be happy? And Huey says, part of the problem is me. I can just never relax, never settle down. Then Huey tells Annie about the worst thing he ever did in his whole life, at least in his hometown. When Huey, Bobby, and Det, as little kids saw a dog trapped on a rock in the middle of a pond, and they stared at this dog, and then eventually they decided it would be fun to throw rocks at this dog. And they were throwing it. They were sort of missing the dog a bit, but eventually Huey hit the dog and he felt really guilty and he decided to save the dog and take the dog back to its home. And the address of the dog was written on the dog's uh, dog tag. Apparently the dog's name was Hamish, which is the fake name that Huey used with Super Duper last volume. So apparently this dog lived miles away though, but Huey felt so bad that he was committed to walking this dog all the way to its home. And for some reason, as Huey's walking this dog home, he imagines himself in Jurassic times and during one of the world wars. I'm not so sure what the deal with this imagery is. But Huey made things right and he returned the dog and he never saw it again. And then Annie says to Huey, that's your deep dark secret? That's the worst thing you've ever done? Huey, all little kids are psychos and you gave into it once, big deal. The fact is you put things right. You pulled it out of the water and you made sure it was okay. You carried it all the way home. And then Huey says, you have no idea what it was like. You didn't see the dog's little face. And then Annie says, you're lucky to have parents as great as you do, Huey, to be who you are. When you were talking to that Alistair Vigors guy and all that stuff about being a tough guy or being like that friend of yours who beats somebody up, she's referring to Huey's characterization of Butcher here. And he says, you don't have it in you to be like that, Huey. You had a nice upbringing. Your mom and dad were too good to you. And I wish you could see that you're not less of a man or some sort of inferior person just because you can't be harsh and cold. She's essentially making the case for Huey against him being as evil and hard as someone like Butcher is. 
saying that it isn't in Huey, even though he tries sometimes. Huey and Annie head back to Huey's parents' house, and Huey's parents tell Huey that that Alistair Vigors dropped by, and he was looking for Huey because he said he found your mobile phone. And Huey grabs the phone, and he see that there's a handwritten note attached to the phone, and it has the word Mallory written on it, as well as a phone number. And Huey knows what this means. This Alistair Vigors, this mysterious painter that Huey met here in Scotland and bonded with over his time here, was in fact Greg Mallory the whole time. Greg Mallory and his motivations with Huey will become more clear in future volumes, but it's very interesting that Mallory wanted to sort of reach out to Huey this way. Because remember, Huey doesn't really know what Greg Mallory looks like, so he wouldn't really know that this was Greg Mallory. But Huey knows Mallory's name, and Huey knows what this means. Huey and Annie say bye to his parents, and they get on a bus heading out of town. And Huey cries on the bus ride. Huey says, They were never anything but good to me. Why can't I just tell my parents I love them? And Huey apologizes to Annie profusely for what he's done and said to Annie recently. And Annie tells Huey, It's going to be all right. Come here. And she holds him as the bus ride rides into the distance. That is how the volume ends. So that was Highland Laddie. And I didn't really love the volume. I, I, I like the debauchery and bombastic action that we normally get in the boys. And this issue was very quiet and reserved and a lot of talking, a lot of introspection, a lot of analysis of Huey as a character. So some of that was interesting. Although uh, some of that character study into Huey, I didn't really love the direction they went with it. Huey spent a lot of this volume kind of whining and complaining and and being annoyed at his friends for making fun of him. And Huey was a real downer this volume, and I didn't really love that characterization of him. I also felt that a lot of stuff in this volume was kind of a little bit ridiculous. So Huey's friends from back home are kind of weird for the sake of being weird. One friend is this big butch crossdresser. The other one has this weird smell and he wears a gas mask all the time. It, like, why? Why are they so weird? It's kind of odd. Also, what is the deal with that 17 foot long tapeworm? What was the point of that scene? I didn't really get that part of it either. So there's lots of things I just didn't dig here. I didn't really care about a lot of the characters in Scotland so much. I, I did enjoy, however, Annie. I enjoyed learning more about her origin, and I liked seeing her stand up for herself with Huey, and I liked watching the two of them sort of work out their relationship issues, so that was compelling, at least. So if I had to give this volume a score, I would unfortunately probably give it a 6.5 out of 10, which for a series I really like for the boys, it's unfortunate that uh, I have to give this one a little bit of a low score because I just had a lot of issues with this one. And we didn't really progress the plot that much. Mind you, I still think it's worth reading because you want to learn about Huey and Annie and their backstory a bit, but just not fully essential. So uh, thank you all for watching, and I'm going to start working on volume 9 and uh, try to get that out. Uh, next week sometime, although it is a really long volume, the longest volume of the boys. So uh, we'll see when I can finally wrap that one up and get it out.